papers. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. It looks like we're streaming live here, Dave. All set? Uh, I believe so. Um... All right. It says that... Uh... That we're streaming. Okay. Well, let's go ahead. It doesn't. It's... Yeah. Yeah. We're we're up. People right. are watching already. So here we are. Oh. So guys, uh, welcome to the team house. Sorry, we're just running five minutes late. A couple little technical issues. Uh, I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park, and uh, you know, joining us from quarantine in Rome, Italy, is Robert Adolf. Robert is the author of Surviving the United Nations. I finished this book uh, just this afternoon. Uh, Robert, or Bob, as he goes by, uh, had a nice long career in U.S. Special Forces. He retired as a lieutenant colonel, and then he had a second career working security for the United Nations in some pretty hot areas during some pretty key times. So, for instance, Sierra Leone in 2000, and, or actually in 2000, when the RUF was sweeping through Freetown. Then in Yemen uh, in 2001, during the 9-11 the attacks and everything else that was happening over in that part of the world. And then right after the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, so we're going to get into all of that with, uh, with Bob, including um, talking a little bit about what's going on in Italy with the coronavirus. And uh, so, um, Bob, thank you for joining us. I know it is like 2 a.m., over in Italy right now. So we really appreciate you taking the time out of, uh, I'm not even gonna say out of your day, but out of your night, you're losing sleep for this. Yeah, thank, thank you for your invitation. Yeah, no, we're, we're very stoked to have you and we appreciate your uh, commitment to doing this. Um, so I, I think maybe, uh, well, actually I have a couple sponsorships to get through, uh, if you'll bear with me just a moment. Uh, the first one I want to tell you guys about is Ned. And I know you guys have seen me talk about this before. I've been using this for eh, probably three weeks now. Uh, Ned is a wellness company. They make a number of different products. One of them that I've been using is this stuff. It's uh, hemp oil and it is 0.3% uh, THC. So it is uh, a product that really, it, I use it every night and it just helps me sleep. I sleep deeper. I used it last night. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm usually a pretty restless sleeper and I just went down and I slept clean through the night and woke up and I had a lot of energy. And that's been my experience with it so far. It's been really good. And uh, I, I fully intend to keep using it. So we're really happy to partner with Ned and work with them. And uh, for our viewers, there's a special discount deal. Their website is helloned.com. If you go to helloned.com slash team house, you will get a discount off of your first order and you also get free shipping. So uh, please uh, consider supporting our sponsor and go and take a look at them. I can definitely wholeheartedly endorse them. And then we have another sponsor uh, that is local to you know, our offices in New York City. These guys are a small veteran owned company out of New Jersey. And we talk about a lot of different important topics on this show, but one of the more important ones is fatherhood, especially in a moment like this. And leadership comes in all forms, especially in parents. And if you're trying to be a high-speed parent, like most of us are, you've got to have the most durable, high-quality, multi-use backpacks and products around from High Speed Daddy. And I really think their uh, Ranger Green Bag and some of their lunch bags are really cool. And uh, you should go check out their website. Um, right now, for you guys who listen to the Team House or watch us on YouTube, uh, they're giving you a 10% discount. If you go over to their website, it's highspeeddaddy.com. And they are giving also uh, a discount. Uh, if you go over there, it's highspeeddaddy.com again. And you use the code, they use my name, Jack. So it's just uppercase J-A-C-K. You put it in, you'll get a 10% discount off of your purchase. So thank you to both of our sponsors for working with us. And we're super stoked to have them on board. So without further ado, Robert uh, or Bob, Thanks again for joining us, um, and let's jump right into it. Please. Yeah, so uh, I was wondering if you could give us, you know, a, a kind of a brief update right off the bat about what's going on in Italy and what your experience is like in Rome. I know you've been writing about it, and you guys as a country are a little bit further ahead of where we are in the United States as far as being deeper into this. Well, uh, we, my wife and I have been in lockdown now here in Rome for... <clears throat> at least six weeks. 
and it's been um, it's kind of like uh, NBC training that we had when we were when we were all young soldiers. Um, when I step outside the house, I go in mask, I go in gloves, I do the grocery shopping. Uh, when I come back, I go through uh, disinfecting uh, procedures, and then I take a shower. Uh, the bottom line is is that neither my wife nor I has uh, gotten infected, and as a consequence, I think because we've been pretty cautious about it. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Italy is at least six weeks ahead of the United States. And I think mm -hmm. it's probably a good idea for those people in America to take a look at what we're going through right now, because what we're, what's happening right now in Rome uh, is likely going to be happening in the United States six weeks from now. So I think everybody needs to buckle down and recognize that there's going to be a long dry spell. Uh, <laughs> there's going to be a long dry spell about going out. How are uh, you and your wife coping, uh, you know, mentally or psychologically? I was wondering if you have any um, any thoughts you could give to um, Americans who are currently experiencing this. And I mean, you come not not only that your direct experience of going through this crisis, but also you were a special forces officer. You were a head of security that had to kind of mentor UN employees on on both the physical and on also you know the the mental mind game. Um, I was wondering if you have any advice for people on how to cope with this situation from that standpoint. Yeah. Actually, if you go to uh, militarytimes.com, uh, I actually did a series of uh, commentaries uh, on the circumstances here and what you can do in order to make your time in lockdown a little bit easier. Um, I don't know if I'm unique, uh, but I do have a unique hobby uh, in that I'm a writer. Uh, this, this gives me an opportunity to do something uh, with my time. Instead of just watching Netflix or becoming a couch potato, um, I've, I've, knocked off, I've knocked off five commentaries for military times that have been published in the last two weeks. And um, I've got three more uh, that I just sent to the uh, editor there today. Uh, plus I'm working on another article uh, for Atlantic Perspective magazines um, out of uh, Holland, the uh, Netherlands, um, what do they call themselves? They call themselves the, uh, the Dutch. The, the, yeah, the Dutch. It's the Netherlands Atlantic Council. Ah. Those are the guys. Um, so my wife, I'm lucky. Uh, my wife is an absolutely superb cook. Uh, so I go out and I do that. I do the shopping. Um, and our relationship actually works out pretty good because she loves to cook and I love to eat. <laughs> and so it works out. it's symbiotic it is i mean i, I it works i think we'll get into it a little bit more later but i mean your wife is egyptian is that correct uh, yeah that's correct mm -hmm. there, there's a you know your book is a professional memoir but i really enjoyed some of the um, parts of it where you talk about your mother and your big uh presumably catholic family and yes. uh and, and talking also about your you know meeting your wife in yemen and mm -hmm. how you met her by her showing up in the hallway of the UN building, screaming in your face. <laughs> yes, she was. And she did. And it was a very funny meeting. And, and then, you know, um, we'll talk about this too, but you both survived a massive bombing in, in Iraq in, in yes. 2003. And that was probably the most harrowing part of it, of your book to read. Um, not just because of, you know, I, I mean, it's a special forces guy. I mean, we know you're going to be in some dicey situations, but when your wife is there alongside you, that's, that takes on like a totally different dimension. It really does. And I'm glad you picked up on that because, um, I had to include, my wife did not want, my wife is a very private person. She mm -hmm. did not want me to write about her in the book. And I said, then I can't write the book. You're too big a part of the narrative. I can't mm -hmm. ignore the space that you fill. Um, so she finally acquiesced and um, I was able to write the book that I wanted to write and included her because she's such a big part of it. And you're absolutely right. Uh, we had a big argument in Amman, Jordan before she went into Baghdad. Um, but essentially she gave me the speech. If you're a husband, you've probably gotten the speech at one time or another, maybe multiple times uh, because we tend to be a little bit thick headed. Um, and the speech in this case essentially told me, I don't have the authority to tell her what to do, where to go, 
all went. So she went into Baghdad with me. And yeah, it was really tough uh, all the way around. I, I wasn't crazy about the idea. I tried to talk her out of it, but she was having none of it. And she was going to share the risk with me. It's uh, it's definitely pretty incredible, the whole story. And, you know, everything that happened after that, after the bombing also, um, from her, her medical recovery and your yes. administrative professional recovery after what they yes. tried to do to you. Mm -hmm. um, but before we start going into all that stuff, I was wondering if you could kind of briefly take us through your military career um, and, and then how that kind of led you into becoming a UN employee. Um, I'd like to take credit for this. Uh, I've had so many people tell me, Bob, you were so smart. You handled it just right. And it's all bull, all of it. <laughs> I, I went blindly through my life. Uh, bouncing off walls, brick walls mostly, um, and I just got lucky. So anybody that, uh, any of my friends that might be listening to this, this podcast out there that remember me from the old days might remember that I was not so bright and that I was not so good and I managed to just kind of limp along. So, but I was lucky and there's no question uh, that sometimes being lucky is better than being good. I, I was going to say the, the old the old gunfighter adage is better to be lucky than good. Yeah, and and I believe it. I absolutely believe it. My life is is living proof of it. Um, but but come on, Bob. I mean, you were the team leader on a combat dive team. I mean, it takes some work. It's some pretty tough stuff. It's not everybody gets that assignment. It was a wonderful assignment. It was one of the best jobs I ever had in the military. Um, I was lucky. I had an opportunity to command four different times, two different special forces teams two uh, different military intelligence companies in uh, Europe, uh, got selected early for the foreign area officer program. Uh, they sent me to a master's degree uh, program in uh, Washington, DC at American University. Um, I, I mean, I, was, I started out as a PFC <laughs> or a private. Uh, really? I, made, I made staff sergeant in 10 special forces group, uh, went to officer candidate school, got branched in military intelligence, um, got uh, qualified as a counterintelligence special agent. I had my first assignment at uh, Bragg uh, as a young lieutenant. Uh, had the opportunity to command those teams. Um, I, I was just so damn fortunate. And then to, to be selected to go to a master's program in Washington, D.C., who gets that? I mean, wow. And then three years in Europe, almost a whole time in command, then back to Bragg. Um, and then probably the, the penultimate assignment for any special forces officer, uh, three years with the Joint Special Operations Command shortly before I retired. Um, three years assigned to JSOC. And I think if memory serves about five months physically there in North Carolina and the rest of deployed, the rest of the time deployed. When, uh, out of curiosity, when you went, uh, you went from enlisted uh, special Oper or special forces NCO, and then you mm -hmm. went uh, MICI, uh, military intelligence, counterintelligence. And when you went back to SF, uh, you were a captain, I assume you had to. No, to no, actually what happened? I, I, I did everything wrong. <laughs> um, I was actually in, I was the deputy chief of special operations proponency at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center in school. And we stood up the special forces branch. And I actually had a hand in helping to do that. And when that happened, when we stood up the special forces branch, I called up uh, military intelligence branch and said, I'm, I'm branch transferring. And they said, Bob, you're out of your bloody mind because I had already done my command time in, in uh, military intelligence. And I was already a senior major by that time. Wow. I was never going to have I was never going to have the time to punch all the tickets I needed to punch in order to get a special forces battalion command. So I essentially committed professional suicide. So but, for the for our viewers who don't know what you mean when you said you stood up the special forces branch up until that point in time, officers would go to special forces, but they but they were still branched to whatever infantry, military, correct. whatever they correct. were. But so they, they were still sort of, uh, you know, beholden to to another, the another branch of the army to another branch of the army. Uh, and so the branches the branches promote. So that this is the bottom line. 
the branches promote. So you spend too much time in special forces, okay? You commit professional suicide. Right. I did it in reverse. I went to special forces, <laughs> decided I was going to commit professional suicide, knew that I would probably end my career as a lieutenant colonel and chose to do it. I started out my career in special forces. I wanted to end it there. That's amazing. And then, uh, go ahead, Jack. Well, I, I was just gonna say, I mean, uh, unless there's anything else you want to hit on there, I was gonna kind of move into um, asking you about UN security. And yes. you, know, you retire, as you said, you retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. You mm -hmm. had a, a really successful career, like you said, going from private to Lieutenant Colonel, um, getting to do a lot of things that, you know, uh, a lot of people wouldn't have the opportunities to. And then you decided to start the second career. I mean, how did you, how does that work? How did you find yourself getting into becoming a security officer for the United Nations? Again, I backed into it. Um, as it happened, one of the things I didn't mention earlier was in between assignments, special forces and military intelligence, I did a couple of tours in United Nations peacekeeping, uh, one in Egypt and in Lebanon, uh, Cambodia, and then my last assignment before I retired uh, in Iraq and Kuwait. So I had a background or at least a familiarity with the United Nations. And I kind of liked what I saw, at least in terms of the aspirations of the United Nations. Those things that we had always liked to think of, uh, how can I say this? Everyone has an idea about the UN, what it ought to be. Very often it fails that test. But I had it in my head that I liked the United Nations. I liked what it stood for. I read the uh, United Nations uh, uh, Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which were both based on uh, the American Declaration of Independence and US Constitution. Essentially, Americans very much were, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, as a matter of fact, uh, was one of the primary authors of those documents. So when I retired, um, I was rooting around for something to do. I actually, I actually taught I worked as a substitute school teacher in the Cumberland County school system uh, for about six months, which was a riot. It was $50 a day, $50 a day. And I got to tell you, you earn every penny. <laughs> so I did that for about a year. And then I took a job as a defense advisor to the Bosnian Ministry of Defense in Sarajevo, post-conflict Sarajevo. I did that for a year. And then I I started applying for other kinds of jobs and I started looking at the United Nations. As it happened, uh, there was an American military officer, a retired Lieutenant Colonel who was working at the UN at the time. Uh, I was introduced to him. I said, this sounds interesting. He told me a little bit about it. I applied for a post and after a year was accepted. I didn't actually, I didn't know what I was getting into. What was the year delay? Was that just the bureaucracy? Was that them running your security? Was that just combination of everything? Um, the job was chief security officer for a United Nations peacekeeping mission in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And if you know anything about the history, about the Revolutionary United Front, they were the worst of the worst. Okay. Everything yeah. I was going to say, can you give us, I mean, for, uh, for me, because I'm you know, not, not very well read, uh, and maybe some of our viewers are right there with me. Can you give us like a, a brief rundown on, on Sierra Leone prior to this, what led up to it and who, uh, who they were and what made them the worst of the worst? Of course, uh, the Revolution United Front uh, was established several years earlier, and there was a succession of coups in Sierra Leone, which is a former British crown colony. So the Brits actually established the place, okay, or established the uh, the country of Sierra Leone as a home for freed slaves. You might recall from, from history that the British were actually highly active uh, in the emancipation movement and then taking those free slaves, bringing them back to the African continent, and putting them in Sierra Leone. It was a British Crown colony up until the 60s when they gave Sierra Leone its freedom. And shortly thereafter, the Revolutionary United Front under a guy by the name of Fodi Sanko, who was a former corporal uh, in the Sierra Leone army, uh, led a revolution. Now, Sierra Leone has a problem. It has a resource problem. It's loaded with uh, diamonds. 
meaning literally what they call alluvial diamond fields. In those alluvial, alluvial diamond fields, you can walk along the ground and pick up diamonds off the ground. The problem with the, uh, the diamonds is everybody wants them. Charles Taylor, next door in Liberia, uh, later uh, convicted by the International Criminal Court of Crimes Against Humanity, uh, was engaged with the Revolutionary United Front in order to steal as many diamonds as they could get their hands on. And he, when I say that the RUF was the worst of the worst, they were criminal rapists. They used rape as a weapon of war. Every single day in my office, we would get reports of rapes. Um, they were absolutely brutal. When they conducted the first, the, uh, the first invasion of Sierra Leone, a year earlier to my arrival, um, they cut off the hands of roughly a thousand people because they voted the wrong way, cut their hands off. Um, you, you had a story, Bob, in the, in the uh, book, which I thought really illuminates uh, the, the child soldier issue. Because on one hand, you know, I think as outsiders, we can look at them as a bunch of thugs uh, or something of this nature. But you tell the story about how the RUF's kind of standard operating practice was to go and round up all the kids in the village at gunpoint Pull them out with an old woman and have them like rape the village, uh, like eldest woman, like a senior yes. citizen, so yes. that the boys are so shamed by this crime they've been forced to commit that they are now tethered, they're coupled to the RUF, they can never go back home. That is correct. Essentially, what they do is they create a psychological cir circumstance where the boy will never want to go home mm -hmm. because of that shame you were just mentioning. So literally, the recruitment techniques of the revolution uh, of the RUF uh, were despicable. And you arrived in Sierra Leone not long after the South African uh, executive outcomes firm, Eben Barlow's company, left the country, right? Uh, actually, yes, they did leave the country, but many of the soldiers who had fought with the executive outcome remained in, in <laughs> Sierra Leone uh, as advisors to the Sierra Leone army as uh, providing security for uh, diamond mines and for gold mines, Sierra Leone also is as uh, considerable reserves of gold. And you describe uh, this, uh, this bar in Freetown, it sounds almost like the cantina in Star Wars <laughs> as far as how surreal it was with all the different colorful characters inside it. It was, uh, if you know the old comic strip, Terry and the Pirates, okay? It was very much like that. And it was very much like the Star Wars bar. You walk into this place, it was absolutely surreal. There were literally dozens of prostitutes, um, ambassadors, <laughs> RUF themselves, uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra Leone cops and military, UN military, okay, UN security, and all mixed together. Mercenaries. Uh, in this, uh, mercenaries, okay, all mixed up in this, uh, this great mismosh. And I had, I, I think I had to rewrite my description of Patty's Chinese Bar and Grill three or four different times because I, I didn't feel like it was giving it justice. Well, it was maybe it, it was the Special Forces Bar. Any Special uh, Forces soldier walking into this bar would have felt right at home. Well, I, I would like to um, because we have limited time with you. Skip a little bit further ahead to um, when the RUF actually invaded Freetown. And yeah. you had to effect a, uh, uh, not an embassy evacuation, but a UN mission evacuation out of the country. Correct. And what was kind of shocking to me to read, maybe it shouldn't be shocking, was how ad hoc all of it was. Like, for instance, you called back to the UN headquarters in New York and said, hey, do you have um, like a manual on how to do a emergency evacuation? Or do you have best practices? Do you have lessons learned? And they're like, no, you're on your own, Bob. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I was kind of shocked the way it went down. Um, when I get out, well, let me back up. In those days, we're talking well over 20 years ago, um, UN security was in its infancy. And at that time, there was just literally a few dozen guys. And it was a few dozen folks up in New York. And it was a mom and pop operation. And the overwhelming majority of the guys who were doing the security job were guys like me, okay, uh, retired officers. 
uh, who had had uh, long military or uh, police backgrounds. And we were expected to go out, hit the field and figure it out. Just do what needs to be done. Um, now, 20 years later, uh, they have uh, training courses, considerable, and they have a certification program. They had none of that when I came on board. <laughs> so you just kind of figure it out as you go. But the, the mission statement was pretty straightforward. My job was to preserve the lives of the civil staff of the mission. You get a nice, clear mission statement like that, that's something I can work with. That's something any one of us can work with. And, and how did that all go down? Because you were through your connections at, at Patty's at the bar and some of the, you know, being an SF guy and an MI officer, you kind of made your connections around town and got pretty good forewarning that the RUF was going to invade. Uh, is that right? Actually, um, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to say what my best source was. Were you able to figure out the best source in the book? Um, it, it sounded like it was the waitress. <laughs> No, no, it was the prostitutes. <laughs> the prostitutes were the number one best intelligence source any intelligence officer could ever hope to have. Okay. Uh, these women are literally sleeping with the RUF. They're sleeping with uh, members of the embassy staffs. They're sleep. Come on. It doesn't take you very long to figure it out. And guys tend to talk. And these girls were happy to talk to me so long as I kept on buying them drinks. And they, <laughs> they, they told me things nobody else knew. I think my reputation probably took a hit uh, in the mission because, I mean, I'd be sitting there in Patty's Bar and Grill, okay, and there'd be two prostitutes sitting at my table. Never took these girls home, but they kept on giving me good information so long as I kept on buying them drinks. I, I mean, did you, did you... Did you go into that sort of knowing that they would be that good a source? Because I think historically speaking, I mean, prostitutes have, have always been the best source of intelligence. I mean, throughout the, the dawn, I mean, so all this- you remember, you remember earlier on, I told you, I attended the counterintelligence special agent course, okay? Yeah. At that time, I was taught at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Some of our instructors were actually pretty good, yeah. pretty knowledgeable. Um, they kind of tip their hat to these things. There's a lot of things we don't talk about in the army uh, that we probably ought to, uh, but my the, the, you won't find it on a formal POI. Right. <laughs> but an experienced agent will look at you and say quietly, pull you aside and say, look, check these women out, okay? They'd be a good source for you. Yeah. Yeah. And they so were. Fascinating. So when the when the bad guys came to town, how do you organize that evacuation? Because like, really, it was just all riding on your shoulders. Like, it was just like up to you to figure it out. I think, I think it would be too kind to say that it was that organized. Um, <laughs> that would be too kind. It'd be, and it'd be inaccurate. Um, we had a lot of problems, a lot of issues. Uh, but I was lucky in several different ways. One, the force commander, uh, an Indian major general, he and I got along real well. He gave me his military police company. He literally handed his military police company to me and said, okay, you can use these guys, essentially have uh, operational control. I used them to secure an outer perimeter and to bring all the UN staff into the Mamioko Hotel in Freetown. Then I was able to call New York and arrange for uh, IL-76s, those huge old Soviet era cargo aircraft to fly out of Brindisi, Italy uh, with uh, UN markings on them to fly down to Lungi International Airport. I also had other Soviet era aircraft, MI-26s, the biggest cargo helicopter in the world and one of the most capable too. Uh, in order to move them across Freetown Bay, put them on the IL 76s and send them to uh, the Gambia, okay, which is about, uh, I want to say about 750 miles to the north. W weren't there some intoxicated Russian helicopter pilots too? That's another great story. Um, <laughs> I, I was just, I was, I've stayed in touch with a lot of the guys that I used to work with, and one of them, one of them was this guy. So what happened was, was the, uh, we, were, we were prepping 
uh, the manifests and the people to get on board the aircraft to fly them over to the IL 76s at uh, Lundy International Airport. Everything was set and ready to go. The senior officer comes in and he refuses to fly the mission. I said, You got to be shitting me. What are you talking about? <laughs> refuse to fly the mission. I don't understand. He said, Then he leans in. He says, Look, some of my crew are stuck in a whorehouse on the other side of Freetown. And he says, I'm not flying this mission until you extract them. So I took two of my guys. They're both, they both New Zealand uh, special ops. Okay. One of them owns a major international security company today. And I was just talking to him yesterday. Uh, we've stayed in touch throughout the years. I handed him uh, I had a nine millimeter uh, in a pancake holster in the small of my back. And I handed it to him and I, said, take my vehicle, go get them. Now, this is Freetown in the middle of the night. Of an invasion. In, yeah, in an invasion, okay? We have no idea where the RUF is, okay? And I'm giving him a very, very tough mission. To his credit, he took it. He, so there was uh, Richard Mitchelson and Graham Mahuka, both from uh, the New Zealand. Um, after a two-hour white-knuckle wait, uh, they made it back with the errant air crew, and we were able to fly the evacuation mission. And they must have came back like, what is a ghost from the way you made it sound in the book? Uh, Mitch was... <laughs> he said like... Understandably. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Understandably. Understandably. I, I just handed him a, I just handed him a nine millimeter. <laughs> Peace shooter. And my, and my, I know. Everybody else has got AK-47s, s FALs, they got submachine guns. Oh, come on. <laughs> Okay, and I hit him a nine millimeter. Yeah, and then you you it's had this these like other crazy experiences where like one guy came to you for the evacuation. One guy came with his pet monkey. Another yeah. guy came with a prostitute that he wanted you to yep. put on the helicopter. Only because he had married the prostitute. He actually showed me a, a piece of paper. He said he just married this prostitute. Everybody that went to Patty's uh, knew that she was a prostitute. Everybody. Okay. I married her, she's my wife. You are required now to evacuate her. And I said, no, I'm not. He didn't understand the rules. It was a non-family duty station. I had no responsibility to move a citizen, particularly a citizen of Sierra Leone, uh, even if it was his wife, because she was, uh, it was a non-family duty station. So by policy, we weren't supposed to move her anyway. But how did that go down? Okay, how much advance notice did you have did you did you try to start the evacuation and the collection of people? Did you receive any pushback from, you know, the UN <laughs> command from other? I, could, I got nothing but pushback. Okay, <laughs> the, the, I, 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 it's very very difficult to explain to people uh, that haven't had a UN experience how difficult it can be working within the United Nations. It was not my decision. I was a chief security officer. I had no authority outside my own office, zip, none, okay? Nobody has to do anything I tell them to do. Uh -huh. It takes the Secretary General of the United Nations to make the decision in order to evacuate uh, staff members from any country anywhere. The head of the mission, the SRSG was from a West African country. He wasn't even in the country at the time. And the UN is not permitted to conduct intelligence. So here we go. Let me back this up a little bit and explain the circumstance. The mandate that was given to the UN peacekeeping mission uh, was to protect the civilians. We, that was one of our missions, to protect the civilians. Um, we're gonna do it with the UN military that comes predominantly from West Africa, Jordan, and India. These guys have never worked together before. Not only that, but several of the battalions weren't infantry battalions. They were actually composite units composed of clerks, mechanics, cooks, and other non-combat specialties. They weren't combatants. They were incapable of fighting. And to add insult to injury, uh, we suspected that many of those units were not up to full strength. So the United Nations was paying, let's, I won't name any countries here, 
pick any country in West Africa, that West African country gives a battalion to the United Nations and the, and the UN pays the country for it. Let's say it's an infantry battalion and maybe 500 guys. Okay. But they only send 300. So they're under strength when they start out. So everybody's flying to everybody all day, every day, and everybody wants to keep a wrap on it. Uh -huh. Wow. No, so nobody wants. Uh, I'm sorry. So when this invasion happens, yeah. I, I mean, like you had advance notice, but you were getting pushed back. So then was, was the entire, was, it was all under duress by the time you finally got people moving? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yep. At the same time, Tony Blair in Great Britain had made a decision uh, to militarily intervene. Uh, he did that with the first Paris, uh, with the SAS elements of the SAS and SBS. Uh, they later took Lungi International Airport. Uh, the RUF decided at some point, foolishly, to tangle with the first Paris. Uh, they didn't do that again. <laughs> and the SAS they, they, ran, I think, was it yeah. Operation Barris? Uh, no, well, they had, yeah, what was it? It's in the book, okay? Yeah. But they named it, yeah, they actually uh, named an operation for it, but the, the, the British did intervene, and the RUF did halt their invasion. Where they halted it, we never we don't know because the in the United Nations we don't have an intelligence system worthy of the name. In other words, most of the time we go around blind. So, Bob, I'm going to uh, skip a little bit further forward because we have limited time again. Um, sure. But um, we'll, we'll talk about Yemen uh, for the bonus segment about this episode after after Sierra Leone. You go to Yemen. And there's this episode I want to talk to you about for the, for sure. the bonus segment about um, uh, uh, the uprising of refugee camp. We'll get to that later. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to go into Iraq and, you know, how you fly from Yemen to Jordan and get put in charge of essentially infiltrating the UN mission from Jordan into Iraq, which is crazy. Um, but for everyone who's joining us live, who just kind of tuned in, we're here with Bob with Robert Adolph. He's the author of Surviving the United Nations, Special Forces Officer, also uh, Chief Security Guy for the United Nations in Sierra Leone, Yemen, and Iraq. And so um, could you tell us a little bit about... Real, real quick, before we move out of here, I, we've got one yeah. question. Uh, uh, thank you, David, and, and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, David Mayer wants to know, uh, what kind of nine millimeter did you give, uh, did you give your New Zealand friend? It was a it was a standard UN issue uh, uh, Smith and Wesson. There you go, Smith and Wesson. Yep, I not my not my personal. I'm a I'm a Glock lover from way back, but that's what it was UN standard back then. So, um, can you tell us then about being in Amman, Jordan, and what you thought your job was there versus what ended up very quickly happening? Well. Um, I was in Yemen. They gave me a call. They interviewed me over the phone. Okay. I got on an airplane and I flew to Cyprus and I met up with everybody in Cyprus, all the UN. And um, of course it was after, uh, now we're talking about late April of 2003 and the American invasion took place in mid uh, the, March, the, the month prior. Yeah. In March. So they decided very quickly that we were going to go back in. So we had to fly from uh, Cyprus over to uh, Amman, Jordan. And then the next morning, uh, we were going to go to take off for Baghdad. What I didn't know was my boss had devised a plan for moving us by vehicle uh, from Amman, Jordan to Baghdad. I knew how to do the security piece of this. And I won't bore you guys with it, but you know, we know how we all know how to move do movement security. What I didn't know was was that uh, when we going into the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman, Jordan, uh, my boss looks at me and said, uh, "Okay, we had, there's going to be a briefing at nine o'clock uh, in one of the ante rooms," and I said, "Okay, at nine o'clock, who's briefing?" He said, "You." <laughs> literally, literally, two hours before. We were to get the, I was to give the briefing. He told me that I was going to be in charge of everything. 
and and then the move the movement is the next day right yes now and i talk about this in the book every ranger student there ever was <laughs> knows how to put together a five paragraph field order yeah. so i did one from memory did the briefing okay just like any buck sergeant in uh, in the 75th Rangers <laughs> could have done what I did, could have done what I did and probably better, okay? But it re-impressed the UN people, okay? When I got done with the briefing, they looked at me and said, wow, that was really great. And I'm going like, Jesus, you know where I pulled this out of, man? <laughs> Okay. So the next morning, five o'clock in the morning, everybody goes downstairs and uh, we hit the road and we make a mad dash. So over 586 miles, I think. Uh, we made a mad dash across the uh, Jordanian and Iraqi deserts in royal blue UN vehicles. Now, have you ever seen a royal blue UN vehicle? No, not, not a not a like a coach bus. No, yeah, no, nope, they're all white. They're all white. But we changed the livery of the vehicles to blue and day glow orange. You know the UN symbol. Put it in day glow orange. The reason why is because some of Saddam Hussein's boys during the invasion stole a bunch of white UN vehicles, okay? Uh -huh. They put some of their paramilitary units in them, okay? In order to get close enough to American formations that were coming from the South, coming up from Kuwait, okay? And so they could fire up, fire up, get inside, uh, and then fire them up. So American commanders told their troops, obviously, you see a UN vehicle, light it up. <laughs> Oh my God. I wasn't, none of us were looking forward to getting lit up when we were coming across the Western Desert. So we changed our livery to blue and Daglo orange. Why, why, I'm sorry, why was the UN, what was their charter to go in while, while this active invasion is happening? Why, why uh, did they want to be there? No, we're talking about going into the wake of the invasion. Okay, so the invasion in is in. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we're talking actually on the 1st of May. Okay. This took place on the 1st of May. Uh, the United Nations was uh, the, the George W. Bush administration actually wanted the UN uh, in Baghdad at that time, who the Americans, the CPA, OHR, the, the Coalition Provisional Authority, yeah. at some point had to turn over Iraq to somebody. Who are they going to turn over Iraq to? I see. Okay. That had to be the UN. And the UN was already in Iraq all throughout that time, conducting the oil for food program, which turned out to be the single greatest, most corrupt program in the history of the organization. Over 60 billion, that's 60 billion with a B, $60 billion worth of corruption. And you thought you, or, or there's some thought that that corruption, um, led to the indemnity, the, the anger of the Iraqi people that may have contributed no doubt to the attack. It. No doubt. There's no question. Yeah. There's no question of it. None. Mm -hmm. you, you, you made mention earlier, my wife's Egyptian. Yes, she speaks Arabic. She was there with me. Okay. She spoke with the Iraqis and the Iraqis knew that the, the UN administered Iraq oil for food program was corrupt. They knew it. Absolutely. They knew it. Okay. It was in their face all day, every day. They said nothing about it under Saddam Hussein's regime because you could end up right, right. with a slit throat and in a, in a dark canal somewhere if you make, uh, made too much noise. Then after Saddam Hussein is overthrown, the same Iraqis now working for the United Nations. Again, they say nothing about the corruption because now they're afraid of losing their jobs. And what did nobody have in Iraq after the American invasion? Nobody had a job. Right. Uh, could you talk a little bit then about the security situation when you got to the, the, um, your building in uh, Baghdad and what that kind of looked like? And I, I'm also kind of interested in hearing because we have heard from other guests of ours um, who were working for the CIA at the time, for instance, about the day that you, Dan say got hemmed up by the American forces and that, that you, you know, you talk about that in your book a little bit also. When I, when I, when we arrived there on the 1st of May, the, the compound, I, I, it wasn't, it didn't have a wall. There was no walled compound. It was a building. It was a hotel, a canal hotel, and it was the UN headquarters. 
um, it was unsecurable. It was right on the canal road. There was another small road going to a hospitality uh, school, uh, essentially people that learn how to work in hotels and stuff like that, that was behind us, but it was wide open. It was absolutely wide open. I told my boss on the first day, there's no way in hell I can secure this place. It's unsecurable. We can't stay here. You know what he said? You read the book, you know. Yeah, this is what we have to live with. So we went from an extraordinarily peaceful circumstance under Saddam Hussein. He maintained security there, absolutely, because if you stepped out of line, you didn't step out of line a second time. Right. And, and no one wanted to stop that corruption from happening either. Well, Saddam Hussein was the genesis of that corruption. Right. So he benefits. Um, and there were several other people who benefited in France, in Italy, in Russia, and perhaps some UN staff members as well. Yeah, it was pretty bad. It was pretty ugly all the way around. And but there was at least like a one good thing that happened. Uh, and, and you know, it was interesting how, like you said, UN did not have a big security footprint. So you were kind of like relying nope. on the charity of others, like the Indian military in Sierra Leone. And in this case, uh, you had a, a, an army air defense company that was kind of seconded to you. What happened was, was that uh, Terry Wolf, then a full colonel, and in command of the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. Um, Terry came to me before he left and said, Bob, would you like me to leave you uh, a platoon? Because I had no security, I had zip, I had nothing. I had no armed security. People don't understand this when I say they, you have to, un my guards are unarmed. Anybody with, a I could have taken that compound with a platoon of half trained Boy Scouts. <laughs> That's how bad it was. Anybody could have done it. So Terry, God bless him, uh, left his air defense artillery platoon uh, with me. And they provided me at least, they could, there's no way 30 guys, and that's what they were, around 30 guys, could manage the security on a, on a complex this large. It was too big. It was too big. Uh, but they could give me some augmentation. Right. So it gave me, and having somethings, better than having nothing. And they were so, a visual deterrent in, in a way, probably. Exactly. Also. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But not an actual deterrent. Yeah. And what was it like then as like, I, I remember another thing that was kind of shocking to me was that like, for instance, you guys were spending money out of your own pockets. You were spending money out of your own pocket, Bob, to pay for things for the transit from Amman to Jordan. You were spending money, you and the other employees were spending money out of your own pocket to build like, put up like steel plates in front of the windows and things we like did. this. I mean, what was it like trying to, you know, essentially beg the UN headquarters in New York for added security and, you know, it, it was like they were, they were, like you were doing something crazy or you were asking for something totally nuts uh, and, and making these requests. Yeah. Um, I knew that the United Nations was not very good uh, at uh, providing fast administrative support. I knew that. So before I left uh, Yemen, I took out if memory serves, about $8,000 out of my personal account. And I carried $8,000 on me. And that's what I spent for the next two months. Wow. And I bought, I bought, I bought fuel, I bought food, I, I got a place to sleep. I mean, everything that was required. I hired uh, Iraqi staff to work in my office on the promise of a contract uh, because I had no budget yet. And, um, the thing you were mentioning about the steel blast shields, mm -hmm. there was one building in that compound that I was personally responsible for, and that was essentially the guard shed and the security information and operations center that was at the front gate. I owned that building. It was my responsibility. It was all security all day. Uh, so one of my subordinates came into me one day and said, uh, Bob, give me a hundred bucks. I'm happy to do so, but please tell me why. And he said what he could do is he could put steel plate flash shields and mount them on the inner walls uh, because we had to protect the radio operators. We all knew that something bad was coming. We all knew it. And we told our bosses a lot that something bad was coming. Um, make a long story short, 
They didn't listen and something bad came. So on the 19th of August, late in the afternoon, a uh, suicide bomber uh, driving a flatbed truck with roughly 2,000 pounds of explosive materials in the back uh, hit our compound and killed 22 and wounded over 150. Um, it was a real bad day. And um, there was a guy I was talking to at uh, Port Belvoir. Uh, anybody said been through anything like this, and many of us have, uh, you need to talk to somebody about it. I didn't talk to anybody about it for a very long time. Um, there was a therapist over at the Fort Belvoir. I went over and talked to him on a fairly regular basis. And he told me, you know, Bob, you've got a skill set that a lot of people don't have. You, you can write. Um, he, along with my wife, both suggested that I write the damn book uh, as a way of, well, being therapeutic. And in fact, it was. The process of writing about that day was extraordinarily difficult, but it got it out of me. And I, I mean, re just reading it, and I just read it, you know, read all that stuff last night uh, for the first time, and it's very harrowing to, to kind of experience it through your eyes. Um, it is very well written. And, and just some of the things that like stuck out at me was, you know, for instance, while well, your wife working down the hall from you, and yep. you went to go get her and, you know, you recovered her. She was alive, thank goodness. But she also had a piece of uh, glass sticking out of her eye. And I, I mean, that like, yeah, the tension in it is like very real. That's because the tension was very real. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why. And I, this is probably, I'm probably a chauvinist but for saying something like this. But um, when it's a guy, it's different. Yeah. 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 It's different. I can do it. If it was a teammate, as opposed to your wife, it would be yeah. very different. Yeah. But it, it's a woman. It's my wife. It's different. It impacted me much more severely than say, if it had been you, mm -hmm. not that you're not a great guy, Jack. Okay? <laughs> no, but I just, understand. Yeah. It just ain't the same thing. Yeah. Yep. And just some of the, the the moments as you were going through that day and you were like, you know, I met this Marine Colonel. I, I yeah. don't remember his name. I don't remember his face. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, finding a, a body, you know, someone who was killed in the explosion. I never really found out who he was like, because you hadn't slept in like over 24 hours. You were exhausted. You just so much going on. And as you're reading it, you tell, you know, your senses are overwhelmed as you're trying to uh, rescue as many people as you can. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I don't, it was the, the worst day of my life. Yeah. And um, it's something that's haunted my memories. It's, uh, I, I know exactly where the scar is uh, above my, uh, on my wife's forehead, uh, where she was cut and she bled all over me. Um, I remember I remember all the carnage. I remember all the, the scenes, but they're disjointed. Mm -hmm. um, the book helped me put them into at least some kind of chronological order. Um, however, I, and I, I had my book reviewed by a lot of people who were there with me uh, and they corrected a lot of things that, mm -hmm. they corrected a lot of things that I got wrong. One of the things I found out, and I should have known before, was that uh, with only one pair of eyes, you only see one part of the disaster. You only see the part that, that's in front of you. And you, you actually described it very well, Jack, when you said that my senses were overwhelmed. And it wasn't until weeks and weeks after, uh, when I'm in a cabin in Vermont with my wife, when I realized how much. Yeah. Do you want to give the viewers some the good news though that your wife is in the next room over and that she? Oh yeah, yeah, she's, she's, she's in the next room. Uh, yeah. she's <laughs> she's fine. She's yeah. fine. She did. She made a full recovery. Did what? Did did you immediately leave Iraq like after that? No, no. So no. what happened? I mean, and and what was like if you didn't leave and what was going on both 
career wise and in terms of what you were doing and then also like emotionally like did you bear resentment towards the UN for being so non-responsive I mean it, like what how, how did what happened next I guess oh it it's even worse however bad you think it might have been double it and it was the actually or the emotion it, the emotion the resentment and what they did to me okay so I've got a stack of documentation like this, okay? Several inches high of all the recommendations I've made of things we need to do in order to improve security, threat analysis, risk analysis, mitigation measures, okay? It's mom and apple pie. Every soldier that ever lived, okay, is gonna recognize the kind of recommendations that I would have made. It was a piece of cake in many ways, but the United Nations at that time was not, supportive. I didn't have enough people. I didn't have enough money. I didn't have enough equipment. I didn't have enough of anything I needed. Plus, they were pouring people into Iraq in order to shut down the all for food program, in order to support the SRSG's political mission. The bottom line is they were pouring people into Iraq at a time when the security situation was actually getting much, much worse. There, was an, there were two attacks down in Al-Hila, there was a major attack in, uh, in Baghdad on the Jordanian embassy, 17 people killed. Um, Helen Keller could have seen this coming. We all, every security officer that was working with me, we all saw it coming. Uh -huh. It was written up in my threat assessment. Nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wanted to believe it. And then until after, after, until and it then, yeah, after the fact, they try to have that little sort of like after action review. And it was like the narrative was exactly the opposite of what you're saying. Like no one could have seen this coming. How could anyone possibly have known this was coming? And you had this moment of like outrage, just like, like furious moment, uh, you know, when blasting these people for their, the lackadaisical approach they've had to security. I've never been madder in my whole life. I was, so, I was, I was shaking. I was, I've never been so mad my whole life, um, but I was still, I, I still, I, I'm, I'm glad I was able to keep my temper and I was able to tell them to their face that essentially in a very professional manner that they were lying sacks of shit. Um, that did not endear me to them. And it also made, also made me a potential whistleblower uh, so, Dave, it was bad enough what happened up until that point. Sure. But then the UN started looking around for scapegoats. Right. I never imagined they could come after me. I was the one guy who was, I was the poster boy for security for the UN in Iraq. Every time they said yes, I said no. Every time they said no, I said yes. And even but from just a CYA perspective, it was like you had emails, 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 huge, emails. Huge, huge. My <laughs> documentation, 95% of everything was documented. 95%. So, so when they came after you, tried to make you the scapegoat. Did, oh, they did. They fired me. And, and, and none of that documentation helped you because they oh, hey. were set on it. No, Dave, they made it all classified. They have a, they have a, a classification system, UN Confidential. They conducted a, uh, a, uh, an investigation, went through all the bells and whistles, conducting an investigation. Then they took all the key elements of the investigation, declared it UN Confidential, wouldn't release it to anybody except the small extracts of it. Okay, and then fired me on the front pages of the New York Times. Uh, and what, what, uh, there's a security council, right? What, what, who was running, like, what country was running the security council at that time? Or do you recall? Uh, that, that, no. Okay. But that would have been within the secretariat. The secretary general is the one who makes all those decisions. Okay. Okay. So the secretary general made the decision to select me as one of the scapegoats. I was fired on the front pages of the New York Times. At the time, I was in Ethiopia 
near the Sudanese border, a place called Gambella, on mission. They had to call, I was recalled from that mission, told I could no longer perform security related duties, and was recalled to New York. And do you feel, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'll say in my mind, like the one of the chief failures of the UN or one of the chief problems with the UN is it's rarely like the UN doing something. It's all these competing, it's all these countries or all these people trying to get to do what's best for them. Of and course. Which creates like the- well, it's natural. Yeah. It's natural. But I don't blame the United Nations. If the United no. Nations did not exist today, we'd have to create it because it provides humanitarian support, UNICEF, nobody else does that. UNHCR, nobody else can do that. The International Organization for Migration, the World Food Program, uh, World Health Organization, nobody else in the world can do what they do. You can say that they don't do it well, well, they do do it poorly. Okay, fine. I'll sign up for that. We still need them to be there performing their functions. They can, long story very short, I ended up uh, engaging in a seven month long pistol whipping contest with the Secretary General of the United Nations that I was pretty sure I was going to lose. I mean, who, who was I? I was nobody. Um, I'm fighting with the most powerful man in the organization. Long story short, I won. It surprised oh, me and everybody. What, what, what does winning mean? What happened? How, how did... I was, winning meant full reinstatement to my former position and uh, status. Uh, so did, you, I, did you get like yeah. a formal apology? Was there a retraction on there? Oh, part? God, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. An apology would have had to, they would have had to admit it that they made a mistake or they made a series of mistakes. And of course, that that was never going to happen. It, 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 you're a better man than me. Like, I don't under. I mean, how, what propelled you to fight for reinstate? I would have gone away mad. I would have taken my toys and gone home at that. I mean, I would have been so. I keep on thinking of was it Rambo two or three when he kicked in the like the the talk door and like just fires the machine gun. Like, that would be first and, blood part two. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I just. <laughs> I, I think of like how angry in your situation, and I can't even imagine, like I, I wasn't even there and I'm just kind of taking on your experience and thinking how angry I would have been. Like what, what did that do for you reinst like reinstatement wise? And what were you, was it just for vindication or did you, did you stay with the UN after that? Did you want that? No, I stayed with the UN after that. And I get this question actually a lot uh, after being, treated so shamelessly uh, by the UN's leadership, why did I stay with the organization? Uh, there may be some, to some degree, it has to do with my own native idealism, but I loved the job that I was doing. Okay. My, my job was to preserve the lives of those individuals, humanitarians, who are trying to save those who are the most vulnerable among us, about the most vulnerable amongst humanity. So rape victims, uh, victims of war, uh, refugees, come on. That's if for someone with my training and background, sure. That, that's the best job I could possibly have. Um, I had effect. Uh, my life mattered. Right. Um, it was a, I spent over 25 years in the American army in service to our nation. And I know it sounds maybe a little Pollyannish, but the fact is, I felt the same way about the United Nations in terms of aspiration. The aspirations of the United Nations are much like the aspirations that are represented in our constitution and in our declaration of independence. Um, we people, we are imperfect vessels. Yeah. And the best of us are trying to be better than the sum of our parts. Um, it's a struggle, but the fact is the struggle makes us better. Once I was, once I was vindicated, if you will, um, immediately they gave me the best possible job I could have, and it would be the UN security advisor for Egypt, which took me to my wife's home country. And I spent four years there 
uh, trying to recover from some of the body blows I took uh, from the United Nations to get to become a victim of, of terrorism in that way, and then to be fired for doing your job. It took a lot of getting over. I, I it can took imagine. a lot of getting over. And when you phrase it the way you did, it makes sense in the sense that you separated the people you were protecting who were the humanitarian, the people with the human, the people on the ground who were trying to help these victims from the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy that that wronged you. Yes. I, I, I can understand that. And I think that, you know, any any US soldier can feel that, you know, in the sense that when people are like, oh, well, your country just sends you here to go do whatever, you're like, yeah, but but I'm there to protect, you know, to to do this job, whether or not our politics are always whether they're about oil or or the, you know whatever. Like I understand that makes the sense. job. The job I did was important, and the job I did was something I loved doing. Yes. The politics. I've never been a politician. Makes sense. That makes sense. It, Robert, towards the end of the book, um, you mentioned uh, there's a whole afterword in the book where you got a hold of the confidential, the UN confidential general secretary report on okay. this bombing in Iraq. And I, I was wondering with the remaining time we have for the, the this interview, um, if you could take a few minutes to talk about what the secretary general was saying in that report versus what actually happened. Well, it wasn't what the secretary general said per se. There was an investigation and the investigation was its job was to assess accountability. Mm -hmm. Who was responsible for failures in Baghdad that led to the deaths of 22 staff members and over 150 wounded? By the way, even today, the UN has never lost that many people all at once in one violent event. It was a watershed moment for everybody. And of course, all the people that were senior wanted to keep their jobs. But in order to keep their jobs, they had to find someone to blame. Right. So even though all the key decisions were made in New York, only one person in New York took the fall. Everyone else was in Baghdad. But we didn't have the money to impact those things. We couldn't approve the pot. We didn't have the authority. All the de key decisions were made in New York. Mm. Uh, any of this sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> it's, a, it's a familiar refrain. Yeah. So everyone above the, everyone that was at the rank of undersecretary general, okay, got a pass. If you were below the rank of secretary general, <laughs> you didn't. So they, they essentially fired the whole chain of command to include me. It's pretty incredible that you were able to surmount all of that. As you mentioned, um, it was kind of a knockdown, drag out fight for a while it was, there. It was bad. It was bad news. And the fact was, every single day, I would get more and more bad news. I, I, I honestly never believed I'd win. I fought for two reasons. One, because it's in my nature to fight. Yeah. Any special operator knows how it, it's in my nature to fight. OK, I may lose but I'm gonna fight. Yeah. And the second thing was my wife. My wife wouldn't let me quit. <laughs> she wouldn't, she wouldn't hear it. And, and she was no. right, and she, she really was right there alongside you literally from the day of the bombing all the way through this whole process in New York. Yes, the whole thing. She was beside me the whole time. And she, she also, never faltered. And she also never said, screw those guys, they're responsible for all this, let's, you know. Let's take our nope. boys and go home. Nope. She said what they want. They want you to quit. Because if you quit, the story ends. She yeah. says, you don't quit. Who, who was the secretary general at the time? Kofi Annan. I never name him in the book. I mean, it's I not. Never, it's just a Google, quick Google search. So it's, you know, but. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But it was Kofi Annan. 
Guys, we are going to do, uh, after we finish here, we're going to do the bonus segment for our supporters with Bob talking sure. about the uh, UN uh, mission in Yemen and uh, a really dicey situation with an uprising in a Somalian refugee camp in Yemen. Um, but guys, this is Bob's book, Surviving the United Nations. We get a good view here by Robert Adolf. Again, I finished reading it uh, this afternoon. It's uh, and we just scratched the surface in this yeah, interview. We yeah. really did just yeah. cover the bare bones basics of it. So I mean, you should really go pick up this book. There's a link down in the description of this video. You can go get it on Amazon. So go check it out. Yeah, please buy the book. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, it definitely for our viewers and the type of people who watch this show, it, it definitely belongs on your bookshelf. Um, it's an important read from a, a, a unique perspective that you don't normally hear from a, you know, a UN security chief speaking out like this and really detailing all of the lessons learned. Um, there's also down in the description is a link to our Patreon site. If you guys like what we're doing on this stream and you wanna support us, um, you can go check that out down there. Otherwise, you know, leave a comment, like it, share it with your friends, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, thanks for joining us live, everybody. Uh, yeah, a uh, couple things real quick. Uh, please subscribe to our channel, you know, hit the notifications so that you get notified. Uh, please check out Bob's book. Uh, and obviously we barely scratched the surface of, I mean, we didn't even really get to talk about the coronavirus. I mean, some of the conversation, you know, the conversation <laughs> Bob and I had earlier about the thin veneer of civility that, that things like pandemics and, and emergencies, uh, both uh, natural and man-made can, can strip away from society. Uh, there's so much here, um, but it's very late. Uh, Bob's in Rome and, and we cannot yeah. keep that long. Yeah, Bob's uh, one of the all-stars for keeping this uh, interview with us through all of this, through the pandemic, yeah. through the fact that I had him come on at two in the morning. So, I mean, we really thank you for doing that. Uh, DJ, thank you thank for you. the donation. And uh, guys, please donate to our Patreon because you get exclusive content. Uh, even a dollar a month helps us out tremendously. Yeah, Bob, uh, amazing. Please, we want to have you on again sometime. I mean, we be my pleasure. We really appreciate it, even if we have to do a a recorded interview at a better time for you. And, <laughs> yes, and just post it. Um, because... Well, recognize that I hope to be back in the United States on book tour because I had to postpone my book tour. Uh, I should be in uh, Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. in the September, October time frame. Okay. Hopefully, keep, the corona will have burned out by that time. Keep me, keep me on, your, uh, on your mailing list, Bob, when, when that happens. Yeah, that, that's fine, because I'm doing presentations yeah. at New York University and at Fordham and uh, St. And St. Peter's as well. Perfect. Okay. All right. I think that's it for the uh, live stream. Uh, so, and we will see you guys next week. Dave, do you want to tell people just before we go who our guest is next week? Uh, yeah. So next week we're having on Patrick O'Donnell, who is, uh, he's been a historian and author for I mean, over 20 years now. Uh, he has one of the, he's conducted thousands of interviews with uh, intelligence operators, OSS operators, Merrill's Marauders. Like um, he's written 12 or 13 books now, 11 or 12 books, most of them on special operations and intelligence. Um, it, fascinating, uh, fascinating. The books he has, uh, we'll, we'll start putting links out to that and everything. Um, but he's actually a friend of mine. We met through, uh, we met, same time I met Clint Sporman with Carl Sestari doing all the hand-to-hand -hand stuff is, is when I met Patrick. Um, so uh, check out, you know, you can look at his bio and stuff like that but yeah that's who we got next friday all right dave you want to uh kill it and then we'll record the uh bonus segment i will i will give it the ronies and we will uh we, sorry that's horrible um thanks guys we appreciate it again thank you bob we really appreciate it and my pleasure thank you